The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. Welcome to Ready, Set, Go, a webinar series sponsored by HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, known as SNAPS. My name is Mark Allison, and I work at the Center for Social Innovation, and I'm the moderator of today's webinar. The Ready, Set, Go webinar series, and SET is an acronym which stands for SNAPS eLearning Tuesdays, will be held every Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The Ready, Set, Go webinar series will provide comprehensive information for continuums of care, HMIS administrators, grantees, project sponsors, and other stakeholders on a variety of topics focused on community planning and capacity building. On behalf of SNAPS, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. Today's webinar is Emergency Solutions Grant, Preparing for HMIS. On today's webcast, we are lucky to have national experts presenting from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, APT Associates, and Cloudburst. Let me tell you a little bit about our presenters. Mike Rowanhouse is the Director of Program Coordination and Analysis Division at the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs at HUD. Michael has been in SNAP since its formation in 1989. In addition to managing the day-to-day -day operations of the division, he is the Director for the Emergency Shelter Program, assists in the management of the Housing Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program, and oversees policy on the homeless elements of the Con Plan, HMIS, Point in Time, and Housing Inventory Counts, and the development of the Annual Homeless Assessment Report to Congress. Tracy Diolano works at AFT Associates and has over 20 years of experience in developing and implementing housing and homeless service delivery systems at both the public and private levels. She spent many years in state government specializing in intergovernmental cooperation, collaboration, and the development of partnerships with nonprofits. Chris Pitcher is a senior analyst at Cloudburst and has 10 years of experience in HMIS implementation, data management, and analysis. He conducts outreach and technical assistance to COCs across the country. His HMIS expertise is focused on data collection, program monitoring, policy and procedure creation, and performance measures. Now I'd like to make a couple of logistical announcements. Today's webinar will last one hour and is being recorded. The webinar recording and PowerPoint presentation will be posted next week on the HUD HRE website, www.hudhre.info. Since we are recording the webinar, all attendees will remain on mute for the duration of the webcast. All of your content questions are very important to us. However, we will not have time to answer these questions today live. Please submit your questions to HUD's virtual help desk at the web address on your screen. Poll questions will be asked during the webinar to get your feedback on the information presented. Your responses help give us a sense of how the webinar is going. As a reminder, you will remain muted throughout the call, and you can submit any questions that you have via the GoToWebinar Questions dialog box on your screen. Materials referenced during this webinar will be available on the HUD HRE website within one week of the presentation. Upon completion of this webinar, participants will be able to perform planning steps necessary to prepare for meeting HMIS participation requirements for ESG-funded programs, Locate tools and instructions on the HRE to assist ESG recipients and subrecipients to start HMIS participation now. Describe the functions and responsibilities of the COC lead, the HMIS lead agency, and the ESG recipients and subrecipients. Get consumers of care and ESG recipients started on taking key actions needed to begin implementing the ESG HMIS requirements. Topics covered in this webinar will be a brief overview of definitions and HMIS ESG requirements, the roles and responsibilities of ESG recipients and subrecipients, the lead COC agency, and the lead HMI administrative agency, pre-implementation activities, data collection requirements, further updates of data collection requirements will be posted on the HUD HRE after the final ESG regulations are released. And finally, an overview of best practices and recommendations for ensuring data quality. Now I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter, Mike Rowanhouse from HUD. Mike? Thank you, Mark. This is the initial training on HUD's implementation of the HEARTH Act amendments to the Emergency Shelter Grants Program, 
which has been renamed the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. HUD has completed clearance of an interim ESG rule within HUD, with OMB, and with other federal agencies. It will now go to Congress for a 15-day review. After the completion of the Congressional review, HUD will publish the regulation as an interim rule. HUD will request comments on the interim rule and will ultimately publish a final rule. We are conducting this training prior to the actual publication of the interim rule because the statutory direction on participation in HMIS is clear and ESG recipients and subrecipients can begin the planning process immediately. The interim rule will provide greater detail on HMIS eligible activity costs and implementation. There will be additional training modules on HMIS once those regulatory details are published. Next slide. Let's start with some basic definitions and requirements as a context for beginning your planning. A homeless management information system is a locally administered electronic data collection system that stores longitudinal personal level information about persons who access the homeless service system. Every continuum of care is required to implement an HMIS to comply with HUD's data collection, management, and reporting standards. ESG recipients and subrecipients should plan on identifying and coordinating HMIS program participation with the applicable HMIS system where ESG-funded programs are located or providing services. Next slide. Under the McKinney-Vento Act, as amended by Hearth, the terms recipient and subrecipient replace the existing terminology for entities that receive grants and subgrants under the Emergency Shelter Grants Program. Recipient means any government, governmental entity that is approved by HUD as to financial responsibility. Recipients are any state, territory, metropolitan city, or urban county or in the case of reallocation, any unit of general purpose local government that is approved by HUD as to financial responsibility and enters into a grant agreement with HUD to administer ESG. Private nonprofit organizations are excluded from the definition because they are not direct recipients under the program. Next slide. Under the McKinney Act, as amended by HEARTH, the term subrecipient includes any unit of general purpose local government or private nonprofit organization to which a recipient awards ESG grant funds. Next slide. Participation in HIMS always has been strongly encouraged and many ESG providers are already participating in an HMIS. The McKinney-Vento Act, as amended by Hearth, makes HMIS participation a statutory requirement for emergency solution grant recipients and subrecipients. Communities have an opportunity to begin working now on the steps needed to be taken to have a currently funded emergency shelter grant program start participating in HIMS and to prepare for future required HIMS participation. Next slide. This chart shows the two-stage allocation process that HUD is using for fiscal year 2011 funds. The Appropriations Act directed HUD to begin implementing the Emergency Solutions Grant Program with an increased 2011 appropriation of at least $225 million. This is up from the $160 million that HUD allocated to emergency shelter grants in 2010. HUD has actually decided to allocate a total of $250 million in fiscal year 2011 funds, a $90 million increase over 2010. The first allocation of $160 million has been released and is being executed under the existing emergency shelter grants regulation because the new rule was not yet published. 
These funds will continue to follow the old shelter grants regulation. The additional $90 million in fiscal year 2011 funds will be allocated subject to the new Emergency Solutions Grants Program interim regulation. Once again, communities need to be prepared to begin implementing the new ESG requirement for HIMS participation once the rule is published and all funds allocated. This completes my presentation, and I will now turn you over to Natalie, who will do our first poll question. Natalie? Okay, thank you very much, Meg. So the first question that uh, everyone should be seeing now on the screen, and I do just want to mention that we've heard from several folks that they are both having trouble hearing the audio, um, as well as several people saying that they're having trouble uh, seeing the slides. So we are aware of that. Uh, we're not sure why those issues are occurring for folks, um, and we encourage you to try logging back um, out and then into the system if you are having trouble hearing or seeing what's on the screen. Okay, so our first question um, asks folks to let us know who is required to participate in HMIS. You should see several options up there on the screen. We're going to pause for about a minute to let folks respond. Um, and your options that you can see are public housing authorities, emergency solutions recipients, government agencies, homeless prevention programs, or E, all of the above. Okay, so we'll wait a little bit longer and let folks respond to that, so please bear with us. Okay, so now up on the screen, everyone should be seeing uh, what responses were provided. Um, and the correct answer that we were looking for actually was B, um, emergency solutions uh, recipients and sub-recipients. I don't want folks to think that um, public housing authorities, other government agencies, or homeless prevention programs are forbidden from entering into HMIS, um, especially HPRP is certainly a program that does enter data into HMIS. But um, in terms of requirements, public housing authorities and other government agencies are not necessarily required to enter. So we're looking for B as the correct response to that one. Okay, I'm going to turn things back over to Chris Pitcher, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the benefits of HMIS participation. Thanks, Natalie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Pitcher, and uh, I have the pleasure of talking to you about the benefits of HMIS this afternoon. Next slide. HMIS participation not only benefits agencies, continuum of care, and policymakers, it also provides significant benefits to persons experiencing homelessness, such as a decrease in duplicative intake and assessments, streamlined referrals, coordinated case management, and assistance in identifying eligibility for benefits and services. For case managers, participation in HMIS provides a snapshot of what happened to the client while in the program, including what services the client received while in the program, and allows supervisors to review a case manager's workload. HMIS can also be a tool for case planning, for recording client progress towards achieving housing and self-sufficiency goals, and HMIS can assist with eligibility determination for mainstream benefits. Next slide. Agency directors and program managers can use information collected in HMIS to improve overall management and quality of the programs, including tracking client outcomes, coordination of services both internally and externally, preparing financial and programmatic reports for funders, boards, and other stakeholders, and information for program design decisions. HMIS has the potential to record demographics such as age, gender, and family status of those served, which provides the opportunity for policymakers to, re to realize where particular needs are thus resulting in a potential for more effective targeting of resources and identification of the needs of all homeless populations, including veterans, unaccompanied children, and other vulnerable homeless populations. First and foremost, HMIS will provide the community with an understanding of the nature and, and scope of homelessness locally. 
identify service gaps, and inform systems decision and policy decisions. HMIS data will be used by COCs to determine progress in meeting key highest performance measures. Next slide. Many communities are using HMIS to answer their own local research and policy questions. Establishing a solid infrastructure for collecting data through HMIS can help ensure that you have the data you need to measure performance and more effectively target resources. HMIS data is being used to better understand the effectiveness of various housing models, what combination of targeted homeless and mainstream services help homeless persons maintain permanent housing, and where homeless per persons congregate to better inform local public health planning efforts. In our community example, Iowa participated in a HUD HMIS study to examine the movement of homeless clients through the homeless service delivery system. The initial migration study used HMIS data to assess the reported zip code of respondents' last stable housing situation in conjunction with the locations of places where services were received. Through understanding the patterns of homeless migration at the point at which a client's stability declines, communities become better able to target services, funding, and programming. Now I'd like to introduce Tracy Dillon. Thanks, Chris. So the next section that we're going to cover is planning. And there are really four main partners that need to come together to help ensure that your emergency solutions grant implementation goes smoothly. Those partners are, obviously, the emergency solutions grant recipients and subrecipients, your continuum of care lead agencies, and HMIS lead agencies. Next slide, please. It's not too early to start planning for HMIS participation. In fact, emergency shelter grant recipients, if not already, can get a head start by participating in HMIS data collection now. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the emergency solutions grant recipient role. Depending upon the ESG jurisdiction, ESG recipients may have to coordinate with multiple continuums of care and multiple HMIS lead agencies. State emergency solutions grant recipients and large urban counties should be prepared for and set up a process for coordinating and monitoring subrecipient participation across multiple continuums of care. One of the very first things that you might want to do as a lead recipient is to identify the continuums of care within your ESG jurisdiction. You may also want to coordinate with each continuum of care to review and understand the local HMIS participation and data quality standards, which may vary slightly from one continuum to another. Consider including HMIS participation and data quality expectations in future subrecipient contracts. Emphasize to subrecipients that HMIS participation and data quality may be a part of regular monitoring, and then determine a process for monitoring participation rates and data quality over time. In addition, subrecipients may need financial assistance to cover HMIS user licenses, equipment, and training. Note that recipients can provide financial support to subrecipients for HMIS participation. Next slide, please. So what is the subrecipient role? Subrecipients play perhaps the most important role in achieving adequate HMIS participation. This is where the rubber really meets the road. One of the biggest things that ESG subrecipient agencies can do to establish is to establish and communicate HMIS data collection and data entry are high priorities for identified agency users and case managers. Agencies that have communicated this expectation to staff are often much more successful in meeting HMIS participation requirements as staff are more likely to do a better job of collecting and entering the information. Next slide, please. So what is the role of the continuum of care? Lead continuums of care should identify who the ESG recipient organizations are that are covered within their jurisdiction. The continuum of care lead agency should work with ESG recipients and the HMIS lead agency 
to define and clarify what the agreed upon policies are for HMIS participation, data quality, and data collection. Remember that, depending upon the COC jurisdiction, COCs may have to coordinate with multiple ESG recipients. Lead Continuum of Care agencies can use ESG HMIS participation requirements as an opportunity to facilitate stronger partnerships with ESG recipients and to improve continuum-wide planning, development of shared outcomes, and preparation for identifying gaps and needs within the homeless continuum of care. Next slide, please. So, what is the role of the, role of the HMIS lead entity? The HMIS lead agency will play a significant and important role in preparing ESG recipients and subrecipients for meeting HMIS participation requirements. Specific activities may include participating and or convening planning meetings, establishing training schedules on data collection, privacy, and the usage of the HMIS system, including potentially expanding training opportunities to ensure that ESG subrecipients have an opportunity to be trained. HMIS lead agencies may want to work with ESG subrecipients to identify software, hardware, and security requirements so that subrecipients can participate. Lead agencies may also want to establish and work with subrecipients to complete all required agreements. Finally, I think it's very, very important that HMIS lead agencies inform ESG recipients and subrecipients of any fees in HMIS participation costs. And HMIS lead agencies may also, if they have not already, start establishing emergency solution and emergency grant programs in their HMIS using the HMIS program descriptors out of the data standard. You will be able to download a program descriptor data dictionary tool, which will help HMIS lead agencies determine how best to set up ESG programs in HMIS. Next, we'll, next slide, please. So let's talk about planning issues. There may be some issues that your continuum will need to resolve. ESG recipients as the HUD grantee are ultimately responsible for ensuring HMIS participation and reporting from funded subrecipients. Continuums of care, emergency solution grant recipients, and the HMIS system administrator should begin thinking now on how best to assist ESG subrecipients to meet participation requirements. Some ideas for ensuring participation include identify the HMIS participation requirements and expectations in subrecipient contracts. You can define and communicate the process and procedures that your community will use to assist subrecipients with HMIS participation costs, staffing, and time needed to enter data. You may want to outline a plan for monitoring participation progress and data quality. For example, will ESG recipients have HMIS access for client level monitoring and reporting? If not, will the HMIS lead agency provide monthly participation and data quality reports to ESG recipients? You might want to look at developing some ideas for troubleshooting if the subrecipients are unable to participate adequately. For example, can additional training be provided to staff? Can data entry be centralized? Does your HMIS system need to be enhanced to allow for rapid entry of data from high volume programs? And is there a process in place to periodically provide data quality reports to subrecipients for better data cleanup? Remember that HMIS is not free. There are real costs incurred by the continuum of care, by the HMIS lead agency and user agencies. Work with your local HMIS implementation to understand the cost and plan accordingly. Next slide. And now we're going to turn it over to Natalie for our second poll question. Natalie? Thanks very much, Tracy. Okay, so as Tracy has described, there's a lot to consider um, and a lot of potential planning to be done. So the question that we have um, in front of us right now is asking, 
um, whether or not recipients should wait until the regulations are published before they start planning for HMIS participation. Okay, so we're going to wait again probably another uh, 30 seconds or so just to let folks provide their responses. So you're going to hear some silence for a minute. Just bear with us. It looks like most folks have voted. So, all right. Um, yes, absolutely. So the, the response that we were looking for here was false. Uh, absolutely, since there is so much to take into consideration uh, well in advance of those regulations actually being published, now is an excellent time to start planning. Um, so greatly encourage folks to take, um, take us up on that uh, advice. Now I'm going to turn things back over to Chris Pitcher, who's going to talk a little bit about what some of these pre-implementation activities might look like. Thank you, Natalie. We're now going to turn our focus to subrecipients and discuss the activities that they can undertake now to get ready for HMIS participation. Next slide. As a subrecipient, you'll want to make contact with your HMIS lead as soon as possible. Since HMIS is slightly different from community to community, you'll want to follow local, HM, local HMIS governance set by the COC and HMIS lead to complete required agreements and contracts. It's important that assessing the cost of participation in HMIS is considered. Since HMIS is not free, these communities' costs will be slightly different. Also, as a subrecipient, Designating a site administrator and identifying your agency users will be an important activity to undertake before implementation of HMIS. Next slide. There are technical and security requirements set by HUD for HMIS. Agencies must be capable of meeting both standards before they are eligible to participate. The HMIS system administrator may be able to assist your agency in finding alternatives to address any gaps in technology requirements. And you should assess the following. Do HMIS computers have access to the internet? Do computers have virus protection? Are the virus definitions current and automatically updated? Are computers protected by a firewall? Is the internet browser and version compatible with the HMIS software application? Do HMIS computers require users to log in? Are they password protected? Do computers have lock, locking screensaver password features enabled? Do computers meet the minimum hardware requirements? Is your monitor placed so that it cannot be easily seen uh, from common areas? Next slide. As an ESU subrecipient, you'll also be asked to work with your HMIS lead agency to complete agency and program setup. A tool that assists in setting up program profiles is posted on the HUD HRE. The current tool fo focuses on program setup for emergency shelter grants programs, but will be updated for emergency solution grants programs once the regulations are published. Also, work with your HMIS lead agency to complete user setup. The executive director or other authorized individual should designate employees that are allowed to collect HMIS data on your agency's behalf. All end users and designated site administrators should attend required trainings, which may include standard operating procedures, privacy, security, and client consent procedures, data entry and software features, data collection processes, report writing, and system administrator training. Additionally, all agencies connected to the collection, management, and storage of HMIS data are required to post a privacy notice at the location where intake occurs and in full view during the intake process. Agencies with a website must also post a privacy notice on their website. Subrecipients must work with their HMIS lead agency to determine local client consent protocols. Client consent choices 
may include implied consent, verbal consent, or written consent. However, informed consent may depend on the policies adopted by your local continuum of care. Lastly, review and understand your local HMIS policies and procedures as you will be asked to comply with them. Next slide. Next, we're going to discuss the collection of the universal data elements for ESG. The universal data elements are the backbone of data collection in HMIS. All programs are required to collect them. Next slide. According to the March 2010 HMIS data standards, a bed or service is considered participating in HMIS if the provider program makes a reasonable effort to record all universal data elements on all clients served in that bed or service and discloses that information through an agreed upon term, agreed upon means to the HMIS lead agency at least once annually. Universal data elements establish the baseline data collection requirements for all participating HMIS programs. The universal data standards are, are the basis for producing unduplicated counts of the number of homeless persons assess, accessing services from homeless assistance providers, basic demographic characteristics of people who are homeless, and patterns of service use, including information on shelter stays and homelessness episodes over time. Next slide. The Emergency Shelter Grants Program are encouraged to start collecting the universal data elements now to prepare for required, required participation of the Emergency Solution Grants Program. The graphic shown on the right side of this slide shows the program intake form for the Emergency Shelter Grants Program, including the universal data elements of first, middle, and last name. Next slide. The above table outlines each required field for whom the data are collected and when the data should be collected to conform with the universal data element requirements. Housing status is, an optional, is optional at program exit for emergency shelter programs. The HUD HRE has posted additional guidance on data collection protocols for each data element. Now I will hand it back to Natalie for our third poll question. Natalie? Okay, thanks very much, Chris. So this is our last poll question um, of the webinar, and um, it's another true-false question. So we're looking for a very specific definition um, right here, and what's on the screen is um, asking folks to confirm, confirm excuse me, whether or not a program is considered participating in HMIS if they enter data on beds that are filled, or filled during the annual point-in-time count. So we're asking basically what does it take in order for a program to be considered participating in HMIS? It looks as though most folks have had a chance to respond. Um, the response that we were looking for here was actually false. So in order for a bed to be or a program, excuse me, to be considered participating, there's a very specific specific definition that's provided in those March 2010 HMIS data standards. And that's that in order for um, a better service is considered participating in HMIS if the provider program makes a reasonable effort to record all universal data elements on all clients served in that bed or service and discloses that information through agreed upon means to the HMIS lead agency at least once annually. But as we can see from that definition, there are some very specific criteria that programs need to meet in order to be considered participating. And as we're thinking about getting new programs like ESG programs on board with HMIS, you want to be sure that you're very clear about that definition and that those programs meet that requirement as well. So again, if you want the language um, for what is considered a participating program, 
you can refer to those March 2010 HMIS data standards, and those are available on the HUDHRE.info website. I'm going to turn it back over to Tracy, who's going to talk a bit about the optional program-specific data elements. Thanks, Natalie. And regarding that question, I think the key here is that even though you only have to disclose that information once annually, it must be data that's collected on all clients being served in that bed or that unit over time. So it's not just a point in time count. Every person served, every person in the family, all the data needs to be collected and transferred into the HMIS system on an ongoing basis. So let's get to the optional program-specific data elements. Program-specific data elements are optional per the data standards, except where otherwise required by HUD. So the program-specific data elements provide information about the characteristics of clients, the services that are provided, and client outcomes. Note that these data elements are optional for currently funded emergency shelter grant programs, but additional guidance and instructions will be provided once the final emergency solutions grant rules are published. So here are the data elements, and you can see the chart. And I'm not going to read them all to you. You can download them um, from the HUD HRE site once they're posted. Please note that COCs may require HMI use user agencies to collect some of the optional program-specific data elements. Recipients and subrecipients should work with their continuum of care to identify any locally required additional data collection requirements. Okay, thank you. Next slide. No surprise here. What you put in is what you get out. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about data quality. There are really four main principles of data quality. And the first one is timeliness and frequency of data entry, which really means entering data as soon as possible after data collection will make it easier to clean up er errors. It's a good idea to establish a policy. And the policy may be something like this. Uh, let's see, enter data within five business days of intake, exit, and service provision will help increase your data quality. You should check with your local lead HMIS agency to determine what the continuum of care policy is. Second principle is data completeness. Work toward collecting all the required information. Establishing a policy setting specific expectations for completion of all required data elements for all household members ensures accurate reporting. For example, Participating programs shall attempt to collect and enter 95% of all required data elements for each client served. Again, check with your local lead HMIS agency to determine COC policy. Number three is data accuracy. Data entered into an HMIS needs to be valid. If valid data cannot be collected, it is better to leave it incomplete or missing, preferably marked as don't know or refuse. Missing information can be acknowledged as missing, while inaccurate data, whether intentional or unintentional, is misleading and may result in the inability to accurately measure performance or accurately report results. And then number four, data consistency. Standardized data collection forms based on workflow and required data elements should be used by all participating data collectors and data entry users. Many continuums of care have standard data collection forms that they require agencies to use. You should review the continuum of care form to verify that all the required data elements are being collected. In addition, ESG standard data collection templates will be posted on the HUD HRE. You may use these templates to collect data if your continuum does not have a standard data collection form or if all the required fields are not included on the continuum of care form. A corresponding emergency shelter grant template with instructions is available also on the HUD HRE. This instruction document provides a standardized list of all required data elements and corresponding responses that should be communicated to all data collectors and data entry workers. The training document outlines the rationale behind why the data is being collected, 
who should collect the data, when the data should be collected, and on whom data should be collected. Next slide, please. Okay, so where do we go to get more information? The, homeless, the, the HUD Homelessness Resource Exchange is, has recently been updated and is a wealth of information. You can, you can search for resources, look for information, download pieces and tools and templates, and you can go to the Ask the Question and Ask Questions. So the next slide that we're going to look at will provide specific links to information that is going to be posted on the HUD HRE about this ESG HMIS phrase presentation. A number of resources are being posted on the HUD HRE for you to use in planning and implementing data collection for existing emergency shelter grant programs. Getting started now will simplify and reduce the amount of time it takes your community to start meeting each Emergency Solutions Grant HMIS participation requirements. Updated Emergency Solutions Grant materials and resources will be posted once final regulations are released. And if you have questions, uh, you can always submit those through the HUD HRE Virtual Help Desk. Please make sure that you uh, choose ESG HMIS participation uh, for your questions. Note that that Virtual Help Desk will be up and running Thursday morning. Okay, so let's see. We may have some frequently asked questions that um, we can attempt to answer. So Natalie, do you want to sort of uh, or do you, want to, do you want to highlight some of the frequently asked questions that we've been receiving so far? Sure, sure. Um, so, and, and again, I do realize that several folks um, continue to have those technical issues with not being able to see the slides. Um, so we will be posting this on the HUD HRE website. It will not be immediate, um, but it will be within a week, and we apologize for the, the delays with that. Um, there are several questions that we did get in. Um, many of them are you know, ones that we likely can't answer just yet until we get those regulations. Um, but the one that folks uh, did ask quite a few times was whether or not uh, domestic violence providers should be entering data into HMIS if they receive ESG funding. Mike, Patricia, do you want to take that? Wanna... I, I think, is Mike still on? I think that that will be addressed uh, in the uh, in the regulations, and I can't really speak to that right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. If there was anything else? Um, so, are there any interim rules or um, temporary guidance that folks should be following right now if they're looking for guidance on ESG and, and data collection for the time being? Well, the, the interim rule will be published soon for emergency solutions grants, and I think that all these templates are things that you can start using now for um, some direction on emergency shelter grant participation. Okay. Okay, and um, I think the million-dollar question that um, all of us wish we had an answer to, but. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we have a specific one just yet, is when those rules will come out or when the regulations will be published. Several folks are asking that as well. That's a mic question. <laughs> well, I can restate what I said earlier. The, the rule has passed okay. within the department, OMB, and all the federal agencies. It is um, on its way to the Hill for the Hill's review. And okay. after that, we will promptly publish it. Okay, wonderful. Um, additionally, I don't know if there's any guidance that we can provide pre-regulation, but some of the folks have asked um, how some of the new, um, with the new ESG data collection requirements, will there be any sort of allowance for some of this funding to go towards um, you know, not necessarily changing software, but doing things like maybe hiring additional staff or hiring an HMIS system administrator. Can, can funds be used for that purpose as well? 
Well, that was that was again covered um, in my initial um, presentation, which uh, said that we can. When the regs are actually published, there's a great deal of, uh, of detail in terms of the eligible costs mm -hmm. and uh, who can incur costs um, okay. under the new uh, regulations. So uh, I'm somewhat handicapped because the regs are not out. Um, mm -hmm. We did this because there was a, a clear indication about the standard. Okay. And, um, and you could plan uh, for it. Mm -hmm. And we do have some time left, so um, let me know if you want me to sort of keep asking questions. We did get quite a few that came in, so I'm, I'm happy to share maybe one or two more if um, Tracy and Mike, you're open to, to doing that. Let, let's, let's take two more, and, okay. then, and then we can wrap up. Okay, great. Um, all right, so one of the questions was if we can provide any further explanation um, of the difference between recipients um, and subrecipients. And um, I think that was just a sort of a broad question that came in. So any guidance we can provide on what the difference is for ESG between recipient and subrecipient? Sure. So your recipient would be what normally folks think about today as the grantee. They're the um, organization, normally the state agency or larger county that receives the initial grant directly from HUD. And the subrecipient would be the local government or the nonprofit agency that receives subgrant from the ESG recipient. So the grant, so it's sort of like grantee, subgrantee, mm -hmm. now it's recipient, subrecipient. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would uh, reiterate that and the fact that uh, recipients are uh, the four territories, Puerto Rico, 50, uh, 50 states, and because of the grant minimum in the program, there are approximately 300 and seven uh, entitlement jurisdictions of the over 1,100 who make the grant minimum. And those are the ones that um, receive a, are considered a recipient, receive a grant, and sign a grant agreement with us. Um, I want to reiterate that the, um, the new rule contains um, the same activities that were under HPRP and that, however, the implementation of the uh, new Emergency Solutions Grant Program uh, does not include, um, is a smaller subset than what was eligible under the HPRP program. Okay. It will be those who were originally got an ESG before uh, HPRP subject to some changes in eligibility. But um, we had changed the grant minimum to a dollar amount uh, under HPRP so that about 185 more of those entitlement jurisdictions were eligible. Those okay. jurisdictions will not be eligible under the, under the new uh, grant. We'll go back to the uh, use of the grant minimum formula in the law. Okay, okay excellent. Um, and then one last question uh, that I think might be useful to share with everyone relates to um, just clarifying uh, a clarifying question. And that is um, whether or not um, private nonprofits are allowed to um, be recipients for ESG, um, or whether or not they need to have um, a another entity be a, a subrecipient. So I, just, I guess just looking for some clarification on who can actually be a recipient and a subrecipient for ESG funds. A recipient is defined uh, in in the statute as uh, the entities I just talked about. States, territories, Puerto Rico, and those entitlement jurisdictions, metropolitan cities, or urban counties, uh, who meet the grant minimum in the law. So a nonprofit cannot be a recipient. Okay, great. It has to seek funding either through a state program, a state recipient, mm -hmm. or through uh, an urban county or a uh, metropolitan city uh, recipient of funds from HUD. Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Mike and Tracy. And then, Mark, were you going to do a wrap-up? Yeah, that's great. We had time for a few of the most frequent questions. Uh, thanks very much, Natalie, and to our panelists. And thanks to everyone calling in and for taking the time to attend this webcast. Uh, as a reminder, if you have questions, additional questions, uh, you can submit them through the virtual help desk. 
Also, again, this webinar recording and PowerPoint presentation will be posted next week on the HUD HRE website. Uh, please join us next week for preparing for your 2012 housing inventory and point-in-time counts, and that will be at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day.